Good afternoon to some of you. Good morning to others. Good evening to some of you. And good eye if you're in Australia. So my name is Chris Stevens, and I have the privilege of being the founding co-director for the Inspired Leadership Initiative here at Notre Dame. Our program is for those people who have completed their traditional careers, but they still got a lot of tread left on their shoes, and they're looking to return to a college campus for an academic year to discover, discern, and then design the next phase of their lives. And it really, it's also more importantly, maybe not just what you want to do, but who do you want to be? So our leadership initiative program is designed for those people of all backgrounds, and that includes Notre Dame grads, as well as people from accomplished places other than Notre Dame and any place around the world. So I want to sincerely thank you for joining us today. I'm really excited about the program that we've got to offer you today. And I also want to start to thank our sponsor, ThinkND, all those who put so much time and effort into their talents to bring this program to life and in, from its original inception. So I'd like to particularly thank the Alumni Association as well. Now, just a couple of technical items. You are all muted by the host to facilitate a smooth program without background noise. Later in the program, we'll have a question and answer session. They'll be facilitated by you submitting questions for our panelists through the Google form, which is being shared with you now. Later, we will select some questions from the group and ask our panelists to respond. Also, we recommend that you use the speaker view in Zoom as that will highlight our speakers as they come on the screen. So today, we are thrilled to be welcome the, to the session for alumni of the Inspire Leadership Initiative. We've had four cohorts so, cohorts so far. So these four individuals came to the LI, ILI from different professional backgrounds, and they represent three of the four cohorts of fellows that we've had it, uh, here. So I wanna to welcome Tom Bard, Kathy David, Michelle Kelrooney and Marty Whalen. So to start, we thought that maybe you'd like to get to know our panel. So I'm gonna ask each guest to share with them what led them to the Inspired Leadership Initiative, perhaps the impact that the program had on their lives, what they're engaged in these days back in their community. So Marty, you in the first cohort, you're the senior fellow. How about you bad lead off, please? Yeah, hi, Chris. And it's nice to be with everybody. I appreciate the opportunity. Um, I, I was a recent retiree and uh, we had just bought a sprinter band. We had four kids in college at the same time in four different time zones. And my wife and I bought a sprinter band that we were gonna travel the country. And she happened to read a New York Times article about the Harvard and Stanford program. And at the end of that, it mentioned that Notre Dame was starting a program like that. So I, uh, I made the contact, uh, talked to Tom, talked to Joan Ball and was fortunate enough to be admitted and had the year of my life. It was just a fantastic year. Um, it was perfectly situated for me because the first year of retirement, I didn't do very well and uh, hadn't planned well and it kind of snuck up on me. But that year gave me the space and the, uh, the mental space, but also the physical space on campus to really kind of discern and figure out what my next act was going to be. Um, and it, it just was a phenomenal year to, to be with a cohort of similar minded people, albeit from various uh, walks of life. And then the interaction with the students and the faculty and the, uh, the campus itself was just, just phenomenal. It, it uh, really ended up being a, a kind of a, a life changing year for me. And then after that, uh, I, I ended up at Notre Dame as the career program manager for the College of Arts and Letters. I, I'm not exactly sure how that happened, but <laughs> it was a phenomenal second job for me. Um, obviously, they didn't check my transcripts when I was a student at Notre Dame, but uh, I got to help students from uh, the College of Arts and Letters realize the importance of their, their degree and how they can plug into the world and make a difference. So I got a program up and running. And now what I'm doing is I split time between here and Bozeman, Montana, and my wife and I are active. Our kids, a couple of them are out there, a couple of them are still here. And I'm involved with a uh, solar panel manufacturing company in South Bend and uh, called Crossroads Solar. And we hire only formerly incarcerated people. So it's a company with a social mission and an environmental mission as well. So I try to stay busy um, and I'm doing a pretty good job of it. Well, they say that there's three kinds of people in this world, people who make things happen, people who watch things happen, and people who wonder what happened. And Marty, you certainly make things happen here. And uh, how's that solar panel company going? You know, it's it's really good. And the, uh, the new in, uh, Inflation Recovery Act, uh, Joe Biden's 
taken a big swing at changing the uh, climate and we're there to help. And so we've got 18 employees and those are 18 people who are really kind of changing their life for the better. So we're really proud of it. Wow. God bless you. Uh, Kathy David, you're out there in California. What say you? I am. Hi, Chris. Hi, everybody. Um, I started to follow along the path of Marty, but I don't have the Sprinter van. I don't have the four kids, but I had left work. <laughs> Wasn't a very good retiree um, and had gotten word of the ILI program. Three different people I know sent me a note and said, you have to do this program. And I thought it was a little bit of a sign. So I went up to the weekend to learn about it and realized how much I love learning, being around schools. I was serving on a couple of different boards at colleges and decided I would, would try this opportunity. And it really was an amazing opportunity, as, as Marty says. It's a lot of what you make of it, but it gave me the opportunity to, um, to have the space to think and be more intentional rather than just going and going and going um, and to really think about what was important to me and what mattered um, to me. It helped to crystallize it. We use the word discern a lot. I don't think I, I knew the word as, as much before I got there, but but it's that idea of what, what really is important. My cohort was a little bit different because we were um, there during the pandemic. Um, and so we got sort of like stopped and didn't actually finish in a traditional way. And ultimately I wanted to do some kind of work like the ILI, but we had, um, kids weren't even going back to school at that point. So I had a former boss come to me and say, he was working on a project and did I want to be involved in it? And when I thought about what was important to me, it was intergenerational learning, working on strategy, ideas, um, th something that mattered to me, making a difference. And so I feel like the work I'm doing now, I'm the chief merchandising officer at World Market, um, lets me do that. Um, and then I also serve on a couple of different boards um, as well from a nonprofit perspective and things like that. So the, the ILI program gave me a chance to be more intentional and thoughtful in my choices and doing things that that matter to me and energize my heart and soul in terms of what I do and how I show up in the world. Uh, Kathy, your new opportunity, was that something that you had set up before you came to the ILI? Did it happen during ILI or did it happen after? It happened afterwards when we left, um, we get left in March with all the students as well. And I was working in Meals on Wheels and doing some things like that, just waiting to see what was going to happen in the world. And a private equity company bought them. So when they came to me and asked me to take this role, I thought about what was important to me. And then it lined up with that. So it's sort of a project based until we sell the company or, or go public. But um, but I still hope to get back into doing something from an intergenerational perspective and learning, because uh, that's that's super important to me is what I've what I've learned. Got it. Thanks, Kathy. Michelle, I think you're beaming in from four time zones away up there in Alaska doing some service work and would love to hear your journey, please. Oh, awesome. Well, I, I loved hearing uh, Marty and Kathy. Thank you for sharing your stories. Mine's a little bit different. I came to the ILI kicking and screaming. I was happily teaching in Iron Mountain, Michigan at a small Catholic school, which has basically been my vocation. But my husband is a graduate of Notre Dame and he went to the webinar and I came home and he said, you're going to do this thing. And I'm like, yeah, right. And I thought, oh, OK, I'll apply. And I did not think I would get in, but I did. And I stopped kicking and screaming and listening to God. And here I am. Um, basically, the impact the year had on my life, the academic year was transformative. Um, it was great meeting the cohort. I have friends that I will consider lifelong friends and colleagues. And I had a great academic year. The professors, the students were so welcoming. I'd like to do a shout out to Steve Reifenberg because he really held my hand a lot. Uh, I'd also like to mention Quinn Gallagher, who is in our life design class, a young student, a 21 year old, who facilitated me going to Kalunga, Uganda this summer and working with Wendy Angst at the St. Makita School. So that was really fabulous. I did that right after ILI graduation. And currently my husband and I are both living in a 200 foot uh, camper with our three beagles in Sitka, Alaska, where we're serving with AmeriCorps. So all in all, ILI had a tremendous impact on my life in terms of again, like Marty and Kathy said, kind of crystallizing, kind of giving me um, a scaffold to hang my beliefs on and really examine not the what I do, but the why and the how. Thank you, Chris. Oh, thank you, Michelle. That's awesome. So Tom Barr, you may not be the senior fellow, but I think you're the senior citizen of this group. And uh, we'd love to hear a little bit from you, please, sir. 
Well, I'm really happy to be included in this group as I was happy to be part of the uh, third cohort. Uh, I came aware of the uh, possibility or the opportunity a little bit differently than most. I had retired in 2014 from a real estate investment development business and I had some volunteer activities for the next several years and uh, started coming back to campus to enjoy football weekends. And uh, I would arrange it in such a way that I'd be here for 10 days, go to two games. And it occurred to me, you know, well, what should I do on Monday, Tuesday or Wednesday? And so I stopped in at the uh, political science office and said, geez, you know, I'd like to sit in the class. Or she said, you, the receptionist said, what did you say? I said, I'd like to sit in the class, you know, Monday, Tuesday, I'm here for football games. And she says, nobody's ever wanted to do that before. I, well, I said, well, see what you can do and I'll come back this afternoon. And so as it turned out over the next several years, I attended half a dozen to a dozen classes at various subjects and was totally uh, overwhelmed by the quality of the teaching and the enthusiasm of the students. And I happened to be on campus the, uh, in 2019 when ILI had an open house, which I attended and uh, all that did was reinforce my interest in the, in the possibility of the program and I applied and uh, was accepted. And the actual experience was even better than what I had anticipated. Uh, I enjoyed my, my classes. Uh, the core curriculum was a, I would say the, the primary takeaway from me was developing uh, significant and enduring relationships with other members of the cohort and the opportunities to think a little bit about uh, here I was, at, <clears throat> I was not the oldest, but I was next to the oldest in the class. And, uh, uh, but what really attracted me was the opportunity to explore uh, a couple of my courses and primarily the, uh, the civil rights in America class which uh, stimulated my interest in uh, actually in South Bend. Uh, as a student in the 60s, uh, I was totally isolated from the community. I think I may have uh, been in, in, in the city maybe three times in four years. Yeah. In those days, we lived on, I lived on campus all four years. I was in the engineering school in the Navy ROTC, and uh, they tended to occupy all my time. So having an opportunity this time around to get some exposure to see how dynamic, believe it or not, the city of South Bend is currently. There's a, an awful lot of activity and, and I was attracted to the possibility of joining a, an entity called Town Makers, which is a group of individuals who are focusing on incremental development, generally speaking housing, but also commercial development in, in the city. Uh, most people don't may not realize that in the when I was a student here, the population of the city was roughly 130,000. Studebaker uh, went bankrupt and closed, and today the population is about 101,000. Uh, and the result of that is that there's vacant lots, there's vacant houses, there's dilapidated housing, and then of course there's plenty of uh, of uh, up to date housing. Well, anyway, so this this has created an opportunity. Uh, to look at uh, these vacant lots and this group that I'm connected with is very much interested in incremental development, as they say. And I'm focusing on the possibility of developing uh, both a duplex apartment and a, and a, with a carriage house on a, on a lot in the near Northwest neighborhood. Uh, the city is also is forward thinking in terms of come up with pre-approved plans for constructing this housing, which is intended to one, reduce the cost as well as the time that it takes to get such a, a process completed. So I've become very interested in that. Um, I'm excited about the, the uh, what I pre perceive to be the forward thinking of the city and the, and the members in the community that I've connected with up to this point in time. So it's been a great experience for me. Oh, that's great. Well, thank you. Thank you all. Um, let me transition, if I may, and want to spend a little bit of time with our guests on the subject of thinking about your legacy. So I looked up Webster and the definition of legacy is something that is passed on. But legacy can take many forms. Uh, a legacy may be one's faith, ethics and values. A legacy may be 
monetary uh, or your assets, a legacy may come from one's character, reputation, the life you lead, <clears throat> setting an example for others and guiding their future. So panel, as you reflect on the legacy you are creating, I'm sure that some priorities have emerged as you shape your lives post ILI. Tom, you really just talked about that you really are engaged in the community. Can you share your thoughts on this, please? Well, what, and frankly, as I became more aware of the, uh, the dynamics here in South Bend, and believe me, I, I, I can't say that I've mastered that at all, but it reminded me of, a, of years ago when I first arrived in Portland, Oregon, and where the majority of my business career, and, in, and particularly in real estate, occurred. And what I what appealed to me is what has turned out to be how accessible the city and the city government, the staff, and the uh, interaction that Notre Dame has with the community. So, so I had, as a result of this program and and as a graduate of Notre Dame, uh, I, it appears to be significant more access than maybe just some guy off the street. Uh, so that's been very meaningful to me, and and the thought that. Possibly I can be uh, a part of the energy that's already present in the city. I, I, I'm just kind of along for the ride for all practical purposes. Uh, but it's it's very stimulating. And, and I, uh, I have I had this hadn't been a priority of mine when I arrived here. It, it has just come about uh, how that's going to relate to a legacy. I don't have any idea, but I'm putting a lot of energy into it at the present time. Great, thanks, Tom. <clears throat> Michelle, uh, your commitment with your husband up there in Alaska reminds me of a fellow who was having breakfast and he looked down and he was having bacon and eggs for the breakfast and he thought to himself, the chicken was involved in the breakfast, the pig was committed. And I know <laughs> you and your husband are definitely committed to service up there in Sitka. Can you maybe share a little bit about your thoughts about your legacy, please? Oh man, thanks, Chris, for that. Um, that was a really challenging question and I had to do a lot of soul searching. And as I was thinking about it, I came across a quote. I don't know who said it. I think it was on the Richard Rohr email that he sends out, but it was, uh, the quote was belief clings and faith leaps. So in thinking about a legacy, and if I look at it through the lens of faith, I kind of hope that my legacy might be to do that for others. I work with primarily throughout the schools that I've worked with. I've worked with marginalized populations, including up here in Sitka. And I hope that as I look through a lens of faith, if I can inspire others to let go of beliefs, preconceptions, uh, doubts, fears, uh, beliefs that they're not worthy, and just inspire them to take that leap of faith, if I can do that, that would be great. I don't guarantee I am, but thanks for letting me take a stab at that question, Chris. That's a tough one. Yeah, I, I, I hear you. Um, <clears throat> Marty, you're, you're up there in Montana and you're here and you're kind of splitting and you got grandkids now. Maybe Lynn, you're obviously the solar pot panel company that you started hiring, you know, 18 previously incarcerated people to be able to turn their lives around. It's pretty amazing. Can you share with us a little thoughts about your legacy? Yeah. Um, last Last year for Christmas, my kids gave me uh, uh, one of those books that you, have, you write over the course. They give you prompts and uh, it's, it's kind of a legacy book. And some of the questions are deep and, you know, you talk about your values, your ethics, things like that. And some of them are just tell stories. Um, but it, it really made me realize that, that the legacy, uh, you know, I had, I had read books during the ILI and afterwards about the next chapter of your life. So I had, I had kind of started thinking of life in terms of chapters in a book. But, but doing that, that project, uh, the, the story book uh, for my kids, made me realize it's much more like a movie uh, with kind of a beginning, a middle, there's some boring parts where the movie drags a little bit and, and uh, some exciting parts. Um, but there's also kind of a future to the legacy that I, I hadn't really considered. So it's got me on the lookout a little bit for uh, what I need to do to complete my legacy. Um, not exactly sure what that is, but I'm open to, to things and a realization that, uh, that there's more to do. I'm, uh, I'm proud, you know, that of 
certain legacies like uh, being a good husband and a good father. Uh, I've got nice brothers and sisters and family. I've done some good in business and things like that. But it seems to me that that uh, we're called to do a, a little bit more. And maybe that's the the last part of the movie. So I'm kind of excited about that as as far as that. And and thinking back to the uh, the ILI experience, I think Kathy or Michelle mentioned discernment. I wasn't a big proponent of discernment. I was kind of like a typical guy just going through life, grinding away. And we had a class with uh, Professor Reifenberg and I I didn't enjoy the, the word discernment, but I really found that there were tools and techniques that were very, very helpful to get through this process of thinking deeply about your life and what you could and couldn't do. And I, I really think without that, I would still be kind of skimming along the surface of life and finding out what's coming to me. I'm not complaining. That was a good way to live for 60 years. Um, but but it, it really helped me, I think, uh, be much more introspective and in figuring out an intentionality to life rather than maybe uh, life happening to me a lot more. So I, I look forward to, you know, looking for things to put in my legacy book, my next uh, my next chapter, I hate to say chapter when we were talking about movies, but yeah, so it's 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 a movie in process. How about that? Got it. Um, Kathy, I, I, whenever I think about you, I think about the quote of uh, Margaret Thatcher. She said, if you want something said, ask a man. If you want something done, ask a woman. And when you were here, you did so much uh, with the cohort and with students and everything. As you think about your legacy, now that you moved on to a new career, what are your thoughts? Um, I loved Marty's responses, by the way. It was a perfect way to think about it. I can't wait to hear the soundtrack of his movie, too, that goes along with it. Um, you know, it, it is funny that you say that, Chris, because one of the things that for me was meaningful was one of the um, presentations I made at Business Ethics Week was I had a student ask me, they said, you know, everywhere I go on campus, I see you, you're like at everything. And it, for me, it was a year of yes. And it was, it was a compliment, you know, the fact that you sort of like show up. And for me, that's a big part of the legacy is showing up and supporting what you believe in and caring about it and demonstrating that, you know, in different ways. Um, and, and the ILI space is the ability to think about that rather than just doing, you get some time to think and then be more intentional as you go forward. Um, I remember once when the Notre Dame development people came and talked to me about it. And I said, you know, I want to give my money that I have to give to causes that make a difference like hunger and, you know, food pantries and things like that. And one of the things that they said that was really helpful to me and in, in crystallizing it is, well, what if instead of giving to a food pantry, you support a student who helps to solve world hunger? So the idea of providing scholarships to people, and I've now established a scholarship in honor of my late husband and my parents who gave me the chance to go to Notre Dame. For me, it's not about my name on a building, but it's about making a difference in the world or doing something. And on a very small scale, um, the idea of grandchildren and next generation stuff that, that Marty referred to, I have a, a lot of godchildren and fairy godchildren and nieces and nephews. And I was trying to figure out how to how to help them in the spirit of being a godparent and thinking about how to think about um, religious formation and philanthropy. And I didn't want to just say, oh, instead of getting you a present this year, I bought a goat for someone in Africa because they don't really understand that. That's like, doesn't seem meaningful to them. But now I give them a gift card or a present and then I write a blank check and ask them to give that to someone else. So they get a gift and then they get to give a gift that doesn't cost them anything. Um, and it's something now that helps them think about what's important to them and what do they want to support and what are the causes they want to support. So for me, it's a really little thing, but it's helpful in terms of passing it on to the next generation, what I think is important and how to go out into the world with the people whose formation I have been charged with helping, helping to contribute to. Wow. So I want to remind the audience because uh, several people joined, I think after we kind of did the uh, rules and regulations of the call, uh, everybody's muted and we're going to go to questions and answers, but a uh, Google form, was sent out uh, about a half an hour ago where you can ask questions of our panel. Uh, so if you haven't had a chance to do that, uh, maybe we can resend that form, Emily, and make sure we have a chance to be able to have people that didn't, we're, on the, we're not on the call at the beginning to be able to have that form. So before we move to the questions that have been submitted, and there's some good ones, um, I'm, I'm kind of curious. Notre Dame is a Catholic school, Catholic Holy, you know, Fathers of the Holy Cross. 
but we're welcoming to people of all religions. And we wanna really emphasize that as it relates to this program. But I'd like to ask our panel on a voluntary basis, what, rule, what role do you see Christ, your faith, your higher power playing in shaping your legacy? Anybody? I'll start. I like what Kathy said um, about saying yes. And I was just having another conversation with one of the cohort, Kathy Garbadino, and we we're talking about Mary and how Mary said yes. And I think that that is so present on the campus of Notre Dame, not in any uh, specific way, Catholicism, et cetera, but just saying yes and going back to the leap of faith, taking that leap. Thanks, Chris. Yeah, thanks, Michelle. <clears throat> Anybody else? Yeah, Chris, I'd, I'd like to answer this question maybe by relating a story. Um, my, my partner in uh, Crossroads Solar was a, is a, was a professor at Notre Dame who mm -hmm. left a tenured professorship to help start this, and it was really his idea. And when I, when I asked him why he was doing this, he said, uh, well, on his tombstone, and he's written many books and delivered many lectures, and he, he's much more accomplished than me. Um, and he said he didn't want on his tombstone it to say author or professor. And I, I said, what do you want it to say? And he said, I'd like it to say saint. And <laughs> I, I laughed. Uh, we were sitting, the two of us, in, at Grace Hall at that cafeteria. And I laughed. And then I realized he was serious. And as we talked through, um, I realized that he was talking about saint with a small s, as in the communion of saints. And I, I really thought to myself, what, what a great thing to aspire to, to be, to be somebody who on their tombstone, it would say, you're a saint, you lived what the gospel tells us to do. And so when you, when you tie that into legacy, you know, I don't, I wouldn't be presumptuous to think what they'll put, ever put on my tombstone, but um, if it was saint or he lived a good life according to the gospels, that would make me pretty happy. Thanks, Marty. Anybody else? I was just thinking that um, through the primarily the coursework of the past year, the uh, uh, I, I just became much more aware of the of the issue of racism, and I would argue the prevalence of it, and experienced as a as a young person growing up and going through uh, my life's work essentially, uh, and uh, so I'm, I, I hope that. And, and desire is to have a meaningful role in uh, in dealing with the issue of racism and hopefully improving that situation. To me, that would be quite noteworthy if I can make any contribution there. Got it. Anybody else? Okay. Well, let's let's go to the questions. And uh, again, there you can either use the chat function or the form that's been sent out there. But if we can, let's go to the questions. And we got a question from Joe Gallagher from Bonita Springs, where seven of my best friends live from high school in Washington, D.C. They real, live right near, I think, all the golf courses down there. But uh, Joe asks, what's your opinion about a second act through small nonprofits? What kind of training should one pursue to meet board governance and financial responsibilities? Um, any thoughts there? Marty, can I throw that one at you? Um, I think a second act is a personal choice, uh, and anything's worthy. It might be babysitting grandchildren, but it takes on a special, a special meaning when you can, when you can combine things that you're interested in with things that you may have a particular in or, uh, expertise in. So if not, if you can take something that that's honed over many years and apply it to the nonprofit world. It's just a multiplying effect that uh, that helps so many people. So I, I think that's a noble cause. Thanks, Tom. You're doing a lot of work in the nonprofit area. Michelle, you are you are too. Any thoughts along those lines? I think the uh, the opportunity in, in the nonprofit realm is extraordinary. Oftentimes, there are others of. Uh, different talents that you can interact with and that basically expand your, your view of the world. Uh, and arguably there's all that's at stake is your energy. And uh, 
the reward to you personally, generally speaking, is much greater than whatever contribution you make. Got it. I guess I, I'd second all those ideas. Uh, one thing I might mention on a more practical way is really examine what's out there already. Because um, as I did some work at Notre Dame, we worked with different food pantries and we saw that there were so many food pantries all serving a different group and it kind of diversified the amount that could be presented. Uh, so I guess my advice on not-for-profits in a very practical way is look and see what's out there already. And maybe you want to collaborate with an existing one. But that's that's just my opinion. Yeah, thanks, Michelle. I would just add, Chris, that there's um, there's a lot of talents and skills that you can bring from whatever you did to the nonprofit yeah. world. But there are some different regulations and different um, things that you have to follow. So there are some like trusteeship if you're working with the school board. But there's other places. I don't know exactly where to tell you to get them. But there's other regulations that you have to live by in working with a nonprofit, and you need you do need to understand those. I don't know exactly where to where you get that, um, but there are nonprofit courses at Notre Dame and other colleges as well um, as uh, just general information. Uh, so your skills and talents are valuable, but sometimes the structural requirements do change in, in the organizations that you work with. Yeah, we have an amazing Masters of Nonprofit Administration here, uh, run by Angela Logan, who's an amazing lady. And several of the fellows have taken courses in that area to try to be able to learn some of the things about governance, governance and financial responsibilities. Uh, Joe Dre from Des Moines asks, what was the role or what continues to be the role of the ND community, faculty, staff, fellows, students, in helping you really kind of define your legacy? Uh, do you stay in touch with, with people from the past? Anybody? Yes. <laughs> Uh, our cohort is pretty active, wouldn't you say, Tom? We meet for yoga on Fridays <laughs> with Joanna Coate. Uh, we have a book club, very active book club, and we have a monthly check-in. So I say our cohort is, is really hanging in there together. And in terms of professors and so forth and staff, uh, just on a personal note, I wish I could stay more in contact, but uh, hopefully soon that will happen. Got it. Thank you. I would echo what, what Michelle just said, but and then mentioned that I've had opportunities to interact with both uh, Joe Dry and, uh, and Steve Reifensberg, which has been very meaningful to me, as well as my advisor from last year, who's, who just, who's retired, but uh, she continues to be available. Got it. Thanks, Tom. Yeah, our cohort has stayed close. Uh, we actually had a uh, twice postponed uh, trip to Ireland, uh, kind of an alumni trip that we took last year and uh, the people who organized it were great. It, we were stayed within a, the Notre Dame ecosystem. So that's always a big plus, um, but it's just good to, to keep connected with the friends. I, I was really surprised at the depth of friendship and the lasting friendships that we made in that, in that academic year. Um, I see some of my cohort on the uh, on the call today, and you know it's it's nice. They're they're friends for life, and whether it's just a, uh, a a birthday greeting on WhatsApp, or we see each other occasionally for a football game or something like that, it's nice. And and professors too. And I, I suppose it's because I came back to Notre Dame for a couple of years to start that program up, but the uh, accessibility of the Notre Dame community, whether it be the ILI or the professors or priests you may meet in passing. Everybody's so friendly and, uh, and they treat you like you're, a, you know, wow, you're back on campus or it's nice to see you back in town or something like that. So it's a good feeling. It's a kind of a, a reciprocal arrangement and I like it. Okay. And our, cohort, gonna... our, cohort, our cohort stays connected and there's a group of them that live in the Northeast who have the ability to see each other. But every day we get a message from Bill or Karen with a daily thought for the day that helps you just think about that group. But I'd also say that for me, um, there's a couple of students in particular that I have stayed in touch with that I was in class, one of Chris's classes with, um, that has been very meaningful as well as some of the classes that I helped facilitate during the pandemic, connecting with people in, in different generations. So that Notre Dame community is very broad um, and very welcoming and very helpful, um, whatever you're going through in life. Yeah, I, I thought um, 
before we move to the next question, this may be obvious to some of you that are on, but I, if I could just maybe highlight the elements of the program. So first of all, we've designed a course that the cohort takes together, Designing an Inspired Life and the Heart's Desire and Great Books. It lasts the entire year and they take that uh, two days a week. Uh, then they have a chance with the help of a faculty advisor to be able to audit two to four courses across the entire university. This, this program has the total support of the president of Notre Dame, the board of directors, the deans, the faculty. Uh, we, Tom Schreier and I tried to be thoughtful in terms of putting it together. Uh, but we also have weekly luncheons with amazing guest speakers. We have weekly dinners for just the cohort. Uh, the cohort really kind of gets together on a Thursday night. Uh, it used to be Wednesday night and they have a wonderful dinner that's part of the program. Um, they also have the chance to be able to do a, a retreat. We had a wonderful retreat with this cohort in October and they also have a chance to do an immersion. And last year we went to New Mexico uh, and this year we'll go back to New Mexico because it was such a powerful, a powerful trip. And then there's the opportunity to be able to guest lecture in your area of expertise. The courses that you might select may not have anything to do with what you, what you uh, had a career in because uh, you've been pounding it for 30 years or whatever, and you haven't had a chance to get in touch with your artistic side or musical side or uh, science or whatever it might be. And you have a chance to take those courses here. So I thought maybe just an explanation of the program a little bit would be, would be helpful. And uh, I don't know if I missed anything there, but um, let me go to, the, to one more question I've got. What advice do you have for young people who are in a different time in their career in life about how they should be thinking about their legacy at this stage of their lives. What do you think? Marty, what do you think? Well, having four of them living <laughs> close to me or far flung starting their careers. Um, and, and also maybe with a thought to what I may, would have done differently. Um, that's always a dangerous, dangerous thing. I go back a little bit to what I said earlier, where just live a good life. Um, that's going to lead you to, to a lot and, and usually the right thing. So when I, when I used to talk to students, I, I told them, I thought, I thought maybe the antidote to some of the unease that they were feeling as they went into the job market could be combated with, uh, with two things. One is curiosity. Be very curious of the world and find out things that you don't know. And the, the other thing is be active. Um, you know, I'm, I'm not disparaging my, I've got three boys and a girl and, and the boys like to play those video games and Notre Dame students, the boys, I would tell them, look, you probably like to play video games. And I'd ask how many hours a week do you spend playing video games? And the average answer was, I don't know, four or six or something. And I would say, well, take one of those hours and do something a little more productive. Um, be a little curious about something in South Bend or, or do that. Because as you kind of peel back the onion of life and find out some of those opportunities out in the world, one of those may be where your true passion lies. And, uh, you know, I, one of, one of the things in the career thing we learned about was that today's students, young people will have an average of 11 jobs. Um, and so, so if you approach life as kind of a smorgasbord and I'm gonna try a little bit of everything, I know that's not a great thing for employers at this point, but it's, an employ it's incumbent upon employers to make a great workplace then for, for young people. So it's just a different time, I think, but to be curious, to be active, uh, that'll kind of lead you in the right direction, I think. Thanks, Marty. Uh, anybody else? Thoughts? I, I don't know that it's specifically how you think about it, but it's that you think about it. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, for me, in terms of like Marty's advice is, is fabulous, but the idea of you get into this, what do you call it? Rat race grind, whatever it is. It's just your life and your job and you get on with things and you go to the next and you go to the next and you don't have the time to say, is this, do I like this? Is this important? What can I learn? Do I have to be so cool that I can't ask questions or pretend I don't know some or pretend I know something when I really don't? Um, and how do you explore those things? And so there's so much in the world and the opportunity to just explore little tiny elements of it, you know, is just incredibly powerful um, for all of us. But thinking about it or taking the time to do that, whatever tool resonates with you. We were given a lot of tools across the classes that you just talked about, Chris. And some of them, 
you may, maybe meditation isn't for you, but exercise is, or, you know, there's like all different ways and place things you can use and find something that resonates with you. And, and that is meaningful. Got it. Thanks. I think it was Lou Holtz who said he had three rules for his football team. I had three rules for a football team. Didn't need four. He <laughs> said, first one, just do the right thing. And this, I, I teach here in the business school. I've got 165 students this semester on foundations of leadership and then a sports management course I designed. Um, but, uh, the first word was just do the right thing. It said, the second one was just be the best you can be. Don't compare yourself to anybody. I think a lot of young people get, you know, they're, they're really concerned about their grades and this and that and be compared, forget about it. Just be the best you can be. And then the final one was show people that you care, show people that you care. If you show people that you care, people are going to want to follow you. And I think it was Colin Powell who said the essence of leadership, the real key to leadership is trust. And Father Hesburgh said, the essence of leadership is vision. You cannot blow an uncertain trumpet. So I think as young people today are coming up and, and trying to figure out what they want to do, um, that they, they have to just think about being real and being themselves. Uh, we've got another question. So what is your opinion about, uh, sorry, um, what advice, sorry, there you go. Uh, would love to hear from each of you. If you could pick a word, a phrase, a sentence to describe what you hope your legacy might be, what would you say? There you go. That's a good one. Tom, I'm going to throw that to you first. Well, I, <clears throat> I think uh, I really liked what Marty had to say about curious. And I, I, I would like to think that people would think that I was a curious person about what's love, going on. Love that. Kathy? You may be on mute. Sorry, yes. Um, that that I was helpful and I made a difference. Nice. Michelle? Uh, I'm really on this Mary thing, so she said yes. Mm -hmm. Marty? Hey, uh... That's that tombstone question. I, uh, I, I think that I would like to be known as a, a mensch, a regular guy. He, he was a regular guy. Okay. So Jeff Douglas from Dallas wants to know, how do you approach your work differently post ILI than how you work before attending the program? Well, wow. So I would answer Jeff's question by saying I am more present and intentional in the work I do rather than thinking about what's next and moving forward. Um, I travel a lot and I sort of say that my memoir would be called perpetually packing because I feel like I'm constantly like getting ready for the next thing, but wherever I am, I am there and, and present with the people I'm with and doing the work I'm doing rather than just using it as a tool to get somewhere else. Uh, and I, that may be age, it may be the ILI perspective, it may be a bunch of things, but it's given me a sense of peace and grounding um, in what I do and how I think about the work I do now. Got it. Thanks, Kathy. Anybody else? Ditto I, to what Kathy said, present and intentional. Got it. Yeah, Marty? I just found it was so reinforcing that, um, again, it just gave me, in a sense, courage to continue to explore and uh, take on new opportunities. So just feeling like I could do it, even though I didn't know necessarily what the outcome was going to be. Got it. And I, I, would, I would add that, uh, well, first of all, I, I like to think of myself as much more retired now than I was before. So I don't, I don't think I have a second career. I'm a silent partner in Crossroads. So let's get that clear. Okay. Um, but I, I really think that, uh, and I don't want this to sound bad for my previous career, because I don't think I was a terrible manager, but I, I think I, it's more illuminating to me now how important a job is to our employees there. And I don't think I ever, I don't think I ever realized that when I was running a different company, I was kind of plowing ahead myself to grow the company and make some money for my family and things like that. But now that I'm arm's length, if you might say, I walk into the, the Crossroads plant and realize what the value of a decent job is to somebody who hasn't had one. So it's given, I would say it's given me a lot more perspective. So um, somebody once said life is about managing expectations. 
And each of the four of you, I'm sure, had some expectations relative to the program. And not to be kind of self-serving here, but how do you feel like the program met those expectations? I think it uh, exceeded the expectations that I had. Um, it's a lot what you bring to it, but, and, and Kathy, that I actually read that book, The Year of Yes by Shonda Rhimes before entering the program. And I, I just found that to be a fascinating book and a, and a good kind of way of looking at life. And especially if you're coming back to Notre Dame. Um, but the, specifically the, the couple of things that I hadn't planned on I was going to do the work on myself. I was going to invest the time and, and discern and things like that. But I didn't understand fully the effect that the cohort would have on me or that the Notre Dame ecosystem would have on me. And I think just being in there, it's just such a nurturing place. And, and you get around friends who are kind of going through the same thing and uh, you can bounce ideas off. And uh, so, so that was kind of an unexpected a little kismet of how uh, that really turned out well for me is uh, the Notre Dame ecosystem and my cohort as well. Got it. I would, else? I would add, Go ahead. I would add to Marty's that um, my expectations were met and exceeded and I, I didn't really know what to expect because it was still really new at the time. But I believe that culture is not neutral or experiences are not neutral. You're either helping or you're hurting. So you can go and just accept what is given to you or you can do the proverbial leaning in and taking advantage of all that's there. And you can't take advantage of everything that's there, but you can find things um, that are meaningful. But it's up to you to do that, um, to do the work. And the expectations are just blown away because of all the things that are possible. Got it. I, I would just add the uh, enduring quality of the relationships of the cohort was uh, way beyond anything I had anticipated uh, and something that I continue to enjoy. Secondly, the, uh, the teaching and the uh, guidance that I was, that was available to me to, in terms of selecting courses and uh, being able to uh, take the, get the best out of the courses was amazing to me. Uh, so it was it was a terrific experience and and again to me it's it's a program that can be that each person can customize to their own needs and uh, and they'll they'll find it to be extremely rewarding. I'd like to um, agree with everything that Tom and Marty and Kathy just said and I would also like to add um, I didn't expect to become so close to the spouses. Many of us were married, some of us weren't, but our spouses, uh, I was so thrilled that my husband had a meaningful experience, not only academically at Notre Dame with the classes he took, but with a spouse group that supported him and supported us. So a shout out to the spouses. Yeah, and I would say that that the, the, we I, some of the spouses who did come with their, their partners, um, uh, weren't sure what what were they going to do with their time while their 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 spouse was in class and stuff, and we have a thing called this week at ND that comes out every Monday, and the spouse would say, hey, we would pour over that thing, and we couldn't do all the stuff that we wanted to do, or even fit them in our schedule because there were so many opportunities, to do, <laughs> whether it's guest lectures, performances, movies, or whatever it may be. Um, Jesse Miller from Nashville asks, do you have a book? Uh, or movie from Hardy, recommendations for somebody looking to define or redefine their legacy? Um, While you're thinking, I'll jump in. So I, I've, I, I teach, I try to teach about life to the students, having been in business for 40 years, and then come back here and, and be able to teach. And a gentleman named Simon Sinek, S-I-N-E-K, has written several books, but his his YouTubes, if you just go on YouTube and type in Simon, S-I-M-O-N, Cynic, S-I-N-E-K, the golden circle. If you don't understand people, you don't understand business. Leaders eat last. Empathy. He's got some great TED Talks and books, and I'd highly recommend anything by Simon Sinek. Uh, anybody else? I'll second your, your stuff because you used to assign those to us in class, and it was just a phenomenal discovery for me, and I've, I've become a huge fan of his. Thank you. Anything else? Okay, Richard Rohr, we were really blessed um, 
to get to have a small group, uh, sort of a class with Richard Rohr, Father Richard Rohr. I didn't even know who he was before I came to Notre Dame. And anything by Richard Rohr, but especially if you download his uh, homilies on any podcast, his homilies are amazing. Thank you. Richard Rohr, R-O-H-R, if you don't know that spelling. So Quinn Gallagher's got a question from Madison, Wisconsin. Wisconsin, how do you make sure that your new or existing pursuits, whether career-wise or in general, align with your inspiration, your purpose, and your values? How do you, how do you ensure that? I literally check in with myself periodically. So every Friday I say to my boss, I'm still having fun, which means I'm coming back Monday. So I don't have to, but like I'm enjoying what I'm doing and I'm feeling like it's providing the nourishment that my soul needs to, to have all the energy that I want and live the kind of life I want. But you have to be intentional about it and be able to say, does this, first of all, you have to know what matters and then you can check in to see if it's actually aligning with what you're doing. Cause otherwise you just get busy and you just keep going. And if you don't yeah. stop, thing, you just keep going. Yeah. I read something the other day and I love this, that this gentleman said, you know, why well, try to, when I start to do something, I think, is this going to help me or is this going to hurt me? And that has really kind of helped me shape how I make decisions these days is to really stop, not be impulsive, but say, is this, is this going to help me? Or is this going to hurt me? And I think to your question, Quinn, um, that, is this aligned with my values or does this not? I mean, is this really something I want to do? And I tell the students also, I love the quote from Confucius, which said that choose a job you love. You never have to work a day in your life. Pursue what you love and the happiness will follow. So uh, just doing what really makes a difference, I think. And I also tell the students, too, that service is key. Shirley Chisholm said, service is the rent you pay for occupying the planet. And so we have service days in our classes where they have to go out and do perform service, pick up trash, make cookies for doormates, whatever it may be. And I tell them, you know, it is impossible to sprinkle happiness on others and not get some on yourself. So I maybe got a couple of minutes here for a final few thoughts, maybe kind of a go around the horn and uh, Marty, maybe start with you. Any final thoughts that you want to leave our audience with as it relates to creating your legacy? I, I said it at the beginning that, you know, legacy is an all encompassing thing. It's from the, your birth to your death. And you can I, I think you can get caught up and it's almost like a, a little bit of ego where you're you're working on your legacy, things like that. So I like to take us a, a step back, even with my own life and, and just realize that, hey, you know, there's a lot going on around me, a lot going around. I've got to be open to it. I've got to be curious to it, see what's going on. And I, I think one of the things that, that I have learned is to don't think too closely about, um, this is almost against what I just heard, but you know, if you've been brought up right, if you've got ethics and, and uh, you know, the uh, culture built, then you can kind of rest assured that the things you're going to get involved in are going to be meaningful and will do some good. And I, I would caution everybody, I think it's easy as you start to go down the legacy path or think about things you did, keep it positive. We've all done things that we would prefer not to, but those add up in the movie too. And that's kind of, you know, that's the spice of, of life, if you will. Don't beat yourself up. We, we all, uh, you know, we all, as you said, Chris, we all have a litmus test against ourselves ultimately. So, you know, you did the best you can and, uh, and you continue to do it. So that's, that's my advice. Just live life well. Yeah. And I love the quote from Desmond Tutu that without forgiveness, there is no future. And so we're all going to mess up and being able to, you know, get yourself off, dust off, make amends with somebody that maybe that you hurt or forgive somebody that hurt you is really, really important. Um, Kathy, your thoughts? Um, I, I appreciate the conversation today and everybody who showed up for it um, because you're obviously thinking about it. So I, I do think it's an, an important thing to think about, but not take too seriously or not let bog you down. When people asked about books earlier, I have a bookshelf that's full of the books, but I sort of take away things from each of them. I take things away from Chris's class or this conversation and sort of you write your own book and what that looks like. And I would encourage you like Marty's literally doing, but for the rest of us to just sort of take a moment and think about what's meaningful and what matters um, and let that be your book that guides you um, on your path. Great. Michelle? I'd say very much what you all would say, be open, be present, be forgiving. And it's more of a comedy than a tragedy. <laughs> Love that. <laughs> Thomas. 
I just the only thing I would add is or reinforce the importance of active curiosity that there's just too much out there in the world that you can contribute to and be part of and really enjoy and follow that. Got it. Well, I, I think that does. I don't think we have any more questions from the audience unless I miss something. But uh, wow, the hourglass is almost empty. So I definitely want to thank our panel, Marty, Kathy, Michelle, Tom, for taking time to be able to share a little bit about your journey and your thoughts about your legacy. And certainly want to thank our staff who helped put this together and uh, thank ND and the folks over there, which is great. So to learn more about the Inspired Leadership Initiative, if you haven't already been there, you can go to our website at ili.nd.edu. We're actually accepting applications for the next cohort, our fifth cohort which will begin in August, 2023 and last through that academic year. Uh, and there's a, some great, you know, you'll see the bios of all the different fellows. You'll see that it's an incredibly diverse group. And we've got the bios of all three, uh, all four cohorts uh, that, that are up there. So um, if you've got questions, your best bet in terms of questions would be to contact uh, Emily Turner, who is our Associate Director for Prospect Development and Alumni Relations. And if you've got a pencil, she's at eturner7, the number seven, at nd.edu. And uh, she's an amazing lady, and she'll help answer whatever you have. So we're going to have another inspiring conversation in January. Uh, keep watching the Think ND, ND uh, website, and they should uh, be able to beam it up there pretty soon. But again, just thank you so much for joining us today and taking the time. A lot of you online here. We hope that this was as beneficial to you as it has been actually for us as well. And I wish you all the very, very best, Merry, Merry Christmas, best of holiday seasons, and a safe and prosperous and healthy 2023. God bless everybody.